things and they have panels with people coming to try to recruit interns. We also have an application development initiative. This was also started by the students and they run hackathons for not just New York City, but the whole of New York State, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And so people from all over can participate in that. Then uh, the CS department itself has some initiatives that have been uh, really quite good in increasing the diversity of our um, majors. In fact, we have about 1,100 majors now, and 42% are female. Uh, we're still trying to get more ethnic diversity, but we're doing pretty well with gender. Um, I can't quite see that. Oh, we have research fairs every semester where people can come and actually try to join some of the faculty in their research projects. That's how I got most of the ones that you saw. Uh, we also have the Emerging Scholars Program, and this is for people who take our introductory course, and uh, it's for people who haven't had much experience in computer science, which is a lot of people still nowadays in high school. And they get to come and talk with people about their research projects and understand that CS is not just about coding, but it's also about uh, solving problems. And it's really interesting. Our PhD students talk a lot there. And two more I'll just mention. Um, uh, we have to go back. <laughs> back, back, back. Back. This one. Okay, sorry about this. We have a, another lab for people who do want more experience in coding, and that's also for our introductory course. And we also have a really interesting uh, course. I don't know what the students that you're involved with might be interested in, but uh, basically it's a course which combines computer science with other um, areas of research and interest. And so this is taught by people from the English department as well as computer science, also history, um, lots of other departments, uh, linguistics, arts, uh, music, etc. So this has been a very popular uh, course. Uh, I don't think this is the right one. If you could go back, please. Yes. Okay, here's some of the projects I'll talk about very briefly. Um, First of all, we've been doing a lot of work in charismatic speech, in which we analyze the speech of politicians, but also people who do podcasts, and try to figure out what makes people uh, really charismatic. Because charisma can also get you elected to various uh, um, positions, but it can also uh, make you a very popular person on the internet. So we've done a lot of work on that. We've also done a lot of work in emotional speech identification, in humor identification. I don't know if any of you uh, know Billy Billy, very popular Chinese co com uh, comedian, woman. And so we did a, a long study of her. Um, we've also done work on hate speech identification in female journalists. So we're trying to uh, allow female journalists to be able to um, actually keep tweets that are hateful from certain people coming toward them. And that's a popular experience too. Um, I'm also having... all the time. <laughs> yes, okay, good. Um, so, I'm not sure, 
Could you go back one? Back? Ah, so here's some of the other things that we're, um, try that we're working on. We're identifying polarizing videos on uh, YouTube, BitChute, and other uh, platforms for radical groups on, and doing this for various uh, social media uh, 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 locations. And also we're trying, we are identifying misinformation on COVID-19 and also on climate change. Uh, th these are projects that are run by our government and they're very interested in being able to figure out how that happens and which ones are the most popular. Okay, next. So now, <laughs> after this uh, over overview, I'm going to talk about some work that we have done uh, with um, a number of people that you'll see in the next slide on identifying trusted and mistrusted speech. Uh, this is important for a lot of reasons, in particular when people are building conversational um, avatars and conversational um, voices like Siri and Alexa, they want to know how to identify what kind of speech uh, these people uh, will be trusted if they produce. Next. So here are all the people who've been working on this project. It's been going on since 2003, <laughs> and it just keeps continuing with more and more interesting aspects that we can identify. And so this was an earlier project, and that was funded, as I'll tell you in a minute, uh, by the Department of Homeland Security, and this one is being funded by the Air Force. Next. Okay, so here's the background. Uh, multimodal deception detection was supported after 9-11. How many people here remember 9-11? <sighs> How many do not? <laughs> Uh, that was very scary for everyone. My husband was in a building that was almost targeted in New York City. Um, after 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security was created by the government, and they wanted to find out what aspects of human behavior are valid indicators of deception. They wanted to know how did the people who um, took, away, took these planes, how did they get into the U.S.? Why weren't they identified as people that you might not want to invite into your country? So they wanted to create reliable automatic deception detectors, and they wanted to do that in many modalities. And they asked us if we would do it on speech. Can we detect speech that really is lying or not? So the current support is from the Air Force, and they're very interested also in identifying trust. Um, because they're building a lot of uh, software and a lot of um, systems that people in the Air Force have to use, and often they find that their own workers don't trust the system. So they want to know how they can make a more trustworthy system by perhaps producing good speech and good text. Okay, so uh, that's what we're trying to do right now. Next. Okay, so why is deception detection a problem? This will give you an idea of how good different groups are in actually identifying deception. You'll see at the top that criminals are the best. They get an accuracy of a little over 65%. And if you look at the rest of these, particularly the ones that are shown in blue, you'll see that a lot of people that you would think are really good deception detectors are in fact not. In fact, parole officers are the worst because they think everybody is lying, apparently. So these have been a lot of studies, not done by us, but done by others to show that people are really poor at deception detection. Next. So how do people decide whether somebody is lying or not? Think about your own uh, process for doing that. Um, most people don't think about it, they just do it. They just assume uh, somebody's telling the truth or somebody is lying. So body posture and gesture are one uh, example of features that are important. Also facial expressions. 
You can sometimes tell that people are lying by viewing their faces. There are biometric factors, but as you may know now, uh, polygraphs are not considered a very valuable tool for deception detection because they tend to be uh, totally inaccurate. So that's why they can't be used in US courts anymore. And brain imaging technologies have also been shown to be useful, but it's very hard to use those if people are coming in through immigration, for example. You can't take their brain images and analyze those. So language-based features are one of the more uh, interesting use and usable, useful and usable features for deception detection, both from text and speech, and that's what we focused on. Next. So the goals of our research are here. We want to identify the acoustic prosodic and the linguistic characteristics of speech that is deceptive or trustworthy. What's the difference? How can we tell the difference automatically by building machine learning models to do this? So we want to develop these automated methods to detect these and to detect deceptive language and trusted language as well. And sometimes these are not always different. People sometimes trust language that is, in fact, quite deceptive. So today's talk, I'll focus on trusted and mistrusted language in a corpus that we collected uh, over about three years, um, which is the largest deceptive speech corpus around. Next. Okay, so this just gives you a very detailed deception of what we did. We brought in 340 uh, people into our lab. Uh, this was when you could still bring people into your lab. And we had them interview each other. We had, there were half native speakers of Mandarin Chinese, half native speakers of standard American English, um, but they were all speaking English during these interviews. Uh, we have 120 hours of speech that we collected. Uh, if any of you have done any corpus statistics, you'll know that's a lot of speech, particularly uh, for speech. Uh, we did a demographic survey. We gave them a resume that they were supposed to fill out. We took their personality scores. We got a baseline voice sim sample from any each of them. And then we had them go into our recording booth, and we had them interview each other. We put, actually it was a blanket because I didn't have a curtain. We put a blanket between them so that they couldn't view each other's faces. We just wanted to get the speech characteristics. We also gave them some financial incentives. If um, a person who was being interviewed told a lie, and the interviewer believed it, we gave them an extra dollar. If the interviewer didn't believe it, we took away a dollar. <laughs> it was very hard to get a lot of money, but some people did. And for the interviewer, if they guessed correctly, we gave them a dollar. If they guessed incorrectly, guess what? We took away a dollar. So a lot of these people came out with just the baseline, which was, it was at the time, $12 an hour. OK, um, so we had them, uh, basically, we asked people who were being interviewed to tell us the answers to a bunch of questions. Some of them were sensitive questions, and some of them were less sensitive questions, like where were you born? Um, I'll show you some examples of these. I'm not sure you can see them in the next one. Uh, and basically, we said, uh, about half of these, we want you to make up a lie. And we gave them time to do it. So it wasn't just spur of the minute lying. They had plenty of time to make up the lie for half of these, and those were randomly selected. OK? Any questions about that? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm going to show you some of the questions, and then you'll see what kinds of things people were talking about. Next. Oops. Sorry. This just shows you the process, which I just described. We had them do the survey, the biographical questionnaire. Um, they took a personality inventory, and we took a baseline of their voice to know what did they sound like when they're not trying to either tell the truth or tell a lie, but just to be themselves. Then we play, they played the line game, and we did another survey. OK, next. Yeah, so can you see these? <laughs> uh, well, 
these were, I, you may say, why did you ask these questions? We went through a lot of different questions to see which ones would be the most useful. So where were you born? That's a pretty easy question, you know. Uh, what's your mother's job? That's also. Have your parents divorced was a little more sensitive. Um, have you um, allergies to any foods? Um, let's see. The, in, the less sensitive or the more sensitive questions. What was the la who was the last person you were in a physical fight with? Have you ever gotten into trouble with the police? Who ended your last romantic relationship? So the idea was that people will be poorer at lying about things that they are sensitive to. So it did turn out to be true. <laughs> OK, next. OK, so this is what we, I'm just going to go over this quickly. We have four units of analysis, and I'll show you our results on these units. First, you could look at simply a pause-free segment of speech itself, a small chunk. Like if I say, what I like is carrots. Those are two chunks, OK? The second one was the turn. That was everything that the speaker said before the other speaker said something, OK? The question response, this was the interviewee's first response to the question we asked. And sometimes it's just yes or no. So that's not always the easiest thing to do. But the question chunk. Uh, the interviewers were allowed to, after the person um, answers a question, the interviewers could ask follow-up questions. And most of them asked a lot of follow-up questions to be able to be sure that they were getting the right answer. Next. <laughs> this is crazy. OK. All this is telling you is this is the interviewer's baseline just above chance. It was 56.4 F1. These are, <laughs> if you see in the, in the colored things, these are the results, <laughs> the results that our machine lear learning model built on the same data did. We were incredibly better than humans at detecting deception. That uh, purple line there, if we looked at the entire chunk, it was 73.6 F1, which is balanced between um, how well you can decide that something that you have said is true is true, and how many things that are true did you actually get as true. So it balances perception and uh, the other. So as you can see, Basically, the colors are just there to show you that we can do a lot better than people at detecting deception. Next. OK, these are the fun ones. <laughs> these are some examples that I want you all to listen to and to be able to tell me whether you think the person is lying or not. So <laughs> this is one of our sensitive questions. Did you ever cheat on a test in high school? Can you play? Uh, no, I don't cheat. I'm a very moral person. Do you want to play that again? Uh, no, I don't cheat. I'm a very moral person. How many people think that she was lying? How many people think she was telling the truth? Now let's see the truth, the actual answer next. She was telling the truth. <laughs> so you get an idea of where we're going here. Next, we've got a few more, just for fun. Oops. <laughs> to be honest, yes. How many people think she's lying? How many people think she's telling the truth? Next. <laughs> but you can get, I'll show you how you can get better later. <laughs> we got a few more. Next. Um, my brother. 
So this is, who was the last person you had a physical fight with? You want to play that again? Um, my brother. Okay, lying? Truth? Next. So see, some of you are getting better. <laughs> some of these voices may be easier. <laughs> Next. Mm, my new roommate. Uh, it was. It was. Um, it was just over a small. Well, actually, it was over a pretty sensitive thing. But uh, I mean, do I have to discuss? I suppose I do. Okay. How many lies? How many truths? Next. <laughs> yeah, you'll see some of the reasons why these things are lies in a little bit. Next. Yeah, um, is my best friend and my former roommate, and I'm going to be the best man at his wedding. And we had drank a lot of alcohol and got in a really big disagreement. And uh, we got in a pretty bad physical fight, I have to say. What do you think? Lie? True? Next? He's lying. <laughs> Sometimes, as we'll find out in a little bit, when they go into more detail, they've planned it, they're lying, okay? This is, there's just one more. Next? Uh, it's my one of actually. It's actually, believe it or not, it's actually one of my best friends. I'm gonna play that again. I think there's a lot of ah. Uh, it's my one of actually. It's actually, believe it or not, it's actually one of my best friends. Okay, lying. True. <laughs> Next. See, you're getting better. <laughs> okay, next. All right, so how do humans, how do you all, how do we all, because I'm a very bad lie detector. I have to tell you, I really am. <laughs> um, so how do you decide what answers are true and what are not? Is it the words that people say? Is it the syntactic uh, structures that they use? Is it perhaps the acoustic content of their speech? Uh, is it the prosody, that is, the intonational contours that they use? And why do humans believe that lies are true? How do human decisions compare with decisions that we make using our machine learning models on the same data? And how does each compare with actual characteristics of trustworthy and untrustworthy speech? Next. So here's what we did, and you may appreciate this at the end because I'm going to tell you uh, what we're doing with it now. So we created a game called Lie Catcher. How many people here, you, I'm probably none of you, do any of you do Amazon Mechanical Turk? Nobody? <laughs> well, it sometimes can be kind of a fun thing. What's the problem? <laughs> oh, what is it? Amazon Mechanical Turk is a crowdsourcing platform that Amazon built. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very popular, particularly now during the pandemic, when a lot of people were staying home and they were really bored. So uh, you can't make a lot of money doing it, but some of the tasks are really quite fun. So we've been putting out uh, AMT tasks for a long time because it's much easier than inviting people to come into your lab and do the same kind of labeling. And for the past year, you couldn't do that anyhow, so it's been very useful. So each task included 12 of the 24 questions that we asked the interviewer and interviewee to talk about, just one at a time, and then we gave them a check question to make sure they were paying attention. Um, we also gave them the audio samples, and these were balanced by gender, native language, question, and speaker, because we wanted to see if the Turkers, because we could put out more tasks to them, would have the same sort of results that our individual interviewees had had, or could they do better? 
uh, we collected the human judgments and some demographic information that I won't be talking about now. Next. Okay, we restricted the raiders to fluent speakers of English. We did ask them if they had any prior law experience, law enforcement experience. I think only about 3% of them said they had. They had to listen to the full response. So they were kind of doing the same kind of things that you were doing here, but they got to listen to it over and over again and make a decision. Um, and we only told them, however, unlike you all, we just told them whether they'd gotten like the whole thing, uh, what their overall score was. We didn't give them a score uh, task by task. Next. next. Okay, here's our lie catcher game. And anybody who is interested can get onto Amazon Mechanical Turk. You can just sign up. Uh, I'm sure most people have Amazon accounts. Uh, it's pretty easy to do. And this is what they saw, um, the game with a purpose. Next. And uh, this is um, what they saw. We gave them uh, in text what the question was. And then just like you guys, they could play the answer. And they had to press true or false. Next. OK, I'll go over this pretty quickly. Uh, we got a lot of utterances with three Raider judgments on each one of them. Uh, I think, oh, it was 4.8% reported that they'd had law experience. They didn't do any better than anybody else, though. And they also reported at the end of the game, and this was pretty interesting to us, what sort of features they used to determine whether somebody was lying or not. And then we gave them their overall score. Next. So, <laughs> as you see, they did not even as well as our human interviewers did. Um, the overall accuracy was just about 50%. <laughs> so, you know, if we aren't very good at deception detection, we're no different from anybody else. Uh, would everybody agreed it was about the same result? There was no correlation. Like, we didn't find that people of different genders or different ethnicities um, you know, were any better at it. However, we did find, interestingly, that female speakers were trusted a little bit more than male speakers. <laughs> Interesting. Next. Uh, and these are just, this is the in, only interesting thing about the personality scores that we saw, that people were high in neuroticism, were trusted more than people who weren't. So neurotic people may be more trustworthy <laughs> than people who are more agreeable <laughs> and open to experience. Next. And this was the inner annotator agreement. And you can see um, the truth bias was about 65% on trust overall. So this means um, it supports Tim Levine's truth default theory that people tend to trust other people. They just tend to trust them a lot more than they mistrust them which is kind of a nice thing when you think about it, but perhaps not for law enforcement people. Next. OK, so here are the features of the responses we examined. I'm going to go over these pretty quickly. Disfluencies, prosodic characteristics, their pitch, their speaking rate, um, their loudness, how complex were the things that they talked about. Um, was this a uh, affect, was the sentiment positive or negative? Did they uh, indicate uncertainty by saying things like sort of, it's sort of blue, or it sort of reminds me? And also creativity, that how creative were their responses? And you may recall some of the responses that turned out to be lying were actually pretty creative. They made up some stories. Next. So basically, what this uh, slide will tell you is that people were really pretty good at using things like filled pauses, like, um, uh, I don't know. Um, and those were actually, um, they, um, <clears throat> Green says that they were uh, correct, which means that they thought that such responses were not trustworthy. Actual deception actually these were good signs of deception when people said things like um and ah uh, a lot. <laughs>
which maybe we, some of us tend to do. Next. And this is where they went wrong. So this is where everybody went wrong. You see the red? <laughs> they trusted aspects of speech that in fact were really good signs of deception in our corpus. Things like speaking rate faster, pitch maximum higher, higher pitch rate, faster speaking and louder speech were valid signs of deception, but people tended to trust them. So this is where poss possibly all of us <laughs> make mistakes. We trust things that in fact are signs of, mis of deception. Next. So disfluencies, they were pretty good at. Prosody, they were pretty bad at. Complexity, they mistrusted more complex utterances. Uh, however, these they mistrusted, and these were uh, signs of deception in our data, but previously not. Next. Affect, while treat, uh, raters trusted more pleasant utterances, this was not a good sign of trust. It could be a sign of deception. Uncertainty, they correctly mistrusted utterances containing possibly sort of hedge terms, but they did not correctly trust utterances that indicated certainty. So these are things that people could learn to do better. Uh, and while people were more creative when they were lying, our raters didn't recognize this. So like all of us, they didn't recognize those more creative answers. Next. So, we asked raters to tell us what kinds of strategies they used, and none of them, none of the things that an individual raider reported, in fact, helped, led them to get a higher rate than anybody else. Next. These are just some of the things they said. Uh, speaking style, length of answer, speed of answer, how relaxed they were. I did notice one person repeat the question. So they gave us lots and lots of different things, but unfortunately for none of them, the things they said actually helped to improve their performance. So again, I know you're saying, well, you've told us this a million times, people are really bad at detecting deception. Next. Um, anyhow, uh, this just will show you, and I'm going to, uh, let's, are we coming to the end here? Okay, yeah, just go to the next slide and I'll show you something. Uh, yeah, we just used a lot of features to detect what kind of speech that people trusted. Next. And this just shows that you that we were able to get pretty good results, an F1 of 61.5 on identified, here we're not dis identifying deceptive speech, we're identifying the kind of speech that people trust, okay? So we can do both. We can identify deceptive speech and we can identify trusted speech. Next. So here's the problem. Current dialogue systems do want to be trusted and trustworthy. Should they produce speech that is uh, actually trustworthy or should they produce speech that people trust? So, I'll leave it up to you guys to decide, but it's a challenging question for AI nowadays. Should we produce speech that is trustworthy or speech that human beings like us trust? Next. Okay, here's the last slide, or the last line. So what we're doing is we're using, and this might be useful for you all, we're using lie catcher, and we want to train people to be better at deception detection, okay? So we're gonna put the same game up, but instead of simply asking people to make judgments, we're first going to uh, give them a sample of the individual's normal speech so they can compare that to the speech that people are saying, and then, we're going to uh, wait, you know, give them a chance to reply, true or false, and if they say it's true, we're gonna tell them why 
they should, they actually believed it's true. What were, what were the features that they may have listened to or should be listening to and congratulate them? If they say it's false and in fact it's true, we'll tell them why they thought it was false and hopefully in this way we'll be able to give them some feedback on whether they are correct or incorrect in their answers. So now we're going to play a video, and this is the very last thing, to show you how this works. Next, and play the video, please. Oh, yes. That's very similar to the University of Science and Technology That means they guessed it correctly. Okay, does everybody understand what was going on there? <laughs> they, they see the question, they listen to the answer, they get to play the normal person's speech, then they make a judgment. If the judgment is correct, we congratulate them and tell them why the judgment is correct. If they make a mistake, we say, this is why you made a mistake. You should have listened to this. So who knows? Now, the only things I will tell you, I started out as really bad at deception detection. I played this game so many times. I'm actually a lot better at it. <laughs> so it might work. We're hoping that at least people have fun playing the game, but maybe also it'll make them better at deception detection. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> and I don't know if I have any time for questions, but if anybody has any, please let me know. Yes? <laughs> so I do too. <laughs> oh, thank you. Perfect. What I find very difficult is for an average person, when you are trying to determine if somebody's lying and you don't know them out of context. So for example, with my kids, I always said to them, I am a human lie detector. Don't even try lying to me because I could tell in a second. But if you're meeting a stranger, and for example, with this, you're hearing a stranger's voice. You don't know them. You don't mm -hmm. know their normal inflections. You can't read them. But not only that, you're not seeing them. You're, it's completely out of context. There's a blanket. You're just hearing a voice. Mm -hmm. So without seeing somebody's facial expressions, without seeing somebody's gestures, you just have a voice. And you have to identify that information. Mm -hmm. I find that so difficult for an average person. So I have a question. Have you ever thought of giving this test to a blind person who's used to perceiving so much more information from mm -hmm. the intonations of speech? Mm -hmm. And if that's they a really good that, idea. No, I haven't thought of do doing that. that. That's a really good idea. You know, I'm just wondering, yeah. like, would they come across with flying colors? Would they be better? Mm -hmm. What kind of information would they be able to give you that you would then be able to apply to artificial learning? Mm -hmm. And then I have one more question. Well, I don't know. Do other people have lots of questions? I don't want to hold this. <laughs> well, we can talk later. Right. Uh, so my question is a little bit off from this field, but in social media, we have a lot of divisive speech. And somehow the algorithm of social media seem to promote division because that has more engagement and more reactions and more comments. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the question would be how, well, does this relate to your work? Mm -hmm. And how would we go about not promoting divisiveness in social media? It, it, it has to do with also something. It, there, there's a false message there. And what do you do? Do you ignore it, or do you start then yes. combating it? Curiously enough, I'm running a workshop tomorrow. <laughs> And we're doing exactly this. It's part of a, a larger DARPA organized workshop uh, to try to figure out what is it, who are the influencers, what do they do to influence people on social media, and how is this harmful, what is it affecting, and how we can address it, how we can hopefully mitigate it. So, yeah, exactly. 
I don't know, <laughs> I hadn't thought about how deceptive speech came in, but you're absolutely right. I mean, we're also looking at a lot of uh, tweets that are misinformation. Yeah, right, good point. It, is there any AI that's sophisticated enough to be in real time recording a person's speech and then you know sort of give you a score as to whether or not their pitch went high or their hesitation or they said um yeah that would give you you know this is 80 percent chance a lie mm -hmm. actually we're being we've been asked by banks but also by insurance companies to try to help them with this. They have mostly, the insurance companies we're working with now have mostly people who are reporting things over the phone. So they have, they collect that audio data and they want to us to build models for them from our models that will actually analyze that and tell them whether the person is, you know, telling the falsehood about they fell on the something rather. So it doesn't quite exist yet. It doesn't that, exist that technology. Yet. No, mm -mm. I think we're the closest to it at the moment, but it's pretty challenging because you don't know what kind of data it's going to be, you know. But yeah, we're constantly being asked to do that. Yeah. Uh, you may have um, answered this in some of the data that I, I missed, but did you identify or can you identify the characteristics of charismatic speech? What makes, because you, you alluded to that at the beginning, you know, what makes someone charismatic versus not charismatic? That's a very good point, and I've never thought of it, so thank you for mentioning it. But uh, yes, the charismatic speech that we've looked at uh, or listened to uh, actually is more um, closer because it's higher in pitch, it's louder, and um, it's faster than non-charismatic speech. And that's exactly what people here were believing was a sign of trusted speech. So people tend to trust, trust charismatic people. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that's very good to know. <laughs> but it makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, listening to this reminds me of, there's a book called Influence uh, by a guy called Cialdini that he wrote so that people could understand when they were being sold to, right? Ah. What were the techniques of selling? Uh -huh. So that he could, he was actually you know, a professor and he wanted to understand you know, how could he uh, detect how he was being persuaded. Uh -huh. uh, and, and, uh, but of course, this book that he wrote so that we could protect ourselves from being sold to actually has become the Bible <laughs> of salespeople knowing how I can convince someone. Perfect. So, <laughs> Are you creating the Bible yes. for people who want to deceive to yes. understand how they can deceive? We have been asked that before, but thanks for asking it again. Um, I think the issues, some of the issues that we have found and published could be useful, but I think a lot of people know how to do, the deceivers, you know, particularly criminals, know how to do that already. Some of the things, though, that it's very hard for humans to um, adjust when they're talking, even when they're, maybe when they're preparing a talk, but when they're just talking to people, are the prosodic and acoustic features. They're just very hard for people to use successfully. If you're an actor, maybe you can, <laughs> but otherwise. Is this really a good thing to put out for people? Anyhow, it's out there already, so too late. <laughs> okay, well, listen, it's been great talking to you. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Uh, when is this over? Today. Yeah, but later tonight or something? Pretty much now. Pretty much now. <laughs> Thanks so much. It was great. And thank you for all the suggestions and the ideas and stuff, and I'm happy to talk to you some more. Come on up. I've got to get my stuff together. Thank you so much. Great job.